Hallelujah. So let's get into the word. We're going to open up to the book of Romans. If you've been following on along online, if you've been watching our Facebook page and our social media, you already know the title of the sermon. You already know the central scripture. For those that haven't, it's going to be in Romans chapter 3. We'll be reading one verse, verse 23. Keep your Bibles open. This is, I don't know if it's going to be a teaching or a preaching, but God's going to give us some word today. We're going to be going through the Bible today. Romans 3, 23. I'll be reading out of New King James, hallelujah. Whichever version you feel comfortable with is fine. That's the one we'll have up on the screen. We're going to read the word, giving reverence unto the Father and unto the Son and unto the Holy Spirit. And the church of God says, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I'm going to read that again. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. May God add blessing unto his holy word. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. You're at home, get situated into a reverent spirit to receive from God of his word today. And God has given me this word for this, for this morning. And the title for this sermon, very simple, two words, the gap. Tell your neighbor, the gap. The gap. I'm not talking about the store, by the way. I know some young people are like, okay, yes, I like the gap. Praise the Lord. No, I'm talking about the gap. A gap is a chasm, an abyss. It's a space that separates one thing or one person from another. And when we look at ourselves in relationship to God as mankind, without Jesus Christ, there is an immense spiritual abyss, chasm, and gap that that exists between us as man and the heavenly Father as God. Hallelujah. Thank you, my brother. Hallelujah. And, 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 and we want to understand that, that this gap was there from the very beginning when man sinned originally in the Garden of Eden. Now, it didn't catch God by surprise. As we know, nothing surprises our God. How many believe that? Amen. He knew what was going to happen, and he had already made provision and eternity for our salvation and our reconciliation. This very real spiritual truth is confirmed in the verses that we, in the scripture that we just read. The Apostle Paul, in today's central scripture, shows us that we, as mankind, uh, 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 fall short of uh, from the presence of God in our human state and nature because of the sin that exists in us and exists in the world without Jesus. And many times and many years and through the millennia, man has tried to find ways to bridge that gap, to connect themselves with God by their own means. But as the scripture tells us and confirms, and as the apostle Paul has made clear in the book of Romans, we fall short of the glory of God. Through the destructive and erroneous spirit of religiosity, man has attempted to designate processes and traditions and rules and regulations and dogmas into into making man believe that if they do certain things and through their own abilities, they can bring themselves yet that much closer to the Lord and to God. But in reality, what has happened throughout the millennia with the churches and religious institutions that instead of bringing man closer to God, in turn, those religious mentalities have driven a wedge and separated us even more and driven us away from God instead of bringing us closer to him. With judgmental condemnation and traditions, the gap between God and man widens and becomes even greater. But the good news, church, and what God has brought me to tell you here today is that it's never too late. We can still turn things around. We as the church of Christ, we that do not believe in religion, but we practice a relationship with the living God. Is there anyone here that has a relationship with the living God through Jesus? Can I hear you? Praise his name. 
So we that believe in a relationship can turn this around. We can bring man into the presence of the Lord, not by signaling where they lack and telling him how bad they are and that they're going to go to hell, but preaching about the goodness of God, the love of God, the favor of God, the grace of God, the anointing of the Lord that comes through a knowledge and a passionate relationship with his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Can someone help me preach this in the house of God? It is time and it is now the day that as the church, we need to seek God like never before. Come on. Oh, you didn't hear me. Now and more than ever, we need to seek God like never before. Can I get an amen? It is the hardest time to serve God right now. Did you know that? Now you think, oh, well, well, Pastor, no, come on. Come on, back in the day, people were persecuted. They are still being persecuted. People were thrown into the Colosseums and burnt alive. They are still being burnt alive. And on top of that, we have technology. We have the world and, and the enemy using the, the, the ease and the comforts and the luxuries of this world to bombard us mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. He does not stop attacking you. He, if he knows that the blood of Jesus is upon your life, he's got you in his sights. Uh, I'm not trying to scare you, church, uh, but I'm trying to tell you the truth of the reality of what you have taken upon yourself uh, when you choose to call yourself a Christian, you have become an enemy to the prince of darkness, uh, to the gates of hell, uh, and they will not stop until they destroy you. But I need you to understand that the word of God says uh, that the gates of hell shall not prevail. Oh, come on. Against the church of the Lord, uh, that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Not because of who you are, but because of Jesus that is in you. Can you praise him in the house of the Lord? And because of you being a child of God, the protection of the Lord, the favor of God, the blessing of the Lord. See, it doesn't matter what comes against you in your, in your life, whether it's emotional, it could be the attack, whether it's physical, whether it's in your finances, whether it's in your family life, whether it's you personally. But I need you to understand that the enemy is going to form the weapon. Come on. He wants to bring you back across the other side of the gap. That is his goal. He wants you to to jump over the cliff uh, into the abyss uh, of despair, of hopelessness, uh, of condemnation and eternal death. Uh, We cannot compromise who we are. We cannot compromise our salvation for nothing. Can you tell me if you believe that with me, church? Can you say amen? amen? Somebody asked me, Pastor, can we lose our salvation? I said, I mean, as if, I mean, it almost annoyed me, the question. I get this question a lot. I says, I mean, what do you think? Your salvation is like a a, a set of keys? They could fall in the cushion of your couch and you lose them and and you can't find the salvation. is not something you lose. The Bible says... That his giftings and his callings are irrevocable. That's about it. So imagine salvation. You cannot lose your salvation. Oh, I don't know where I put it today. I can't find my salvation. Is that what happens? No, 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 no. When you are no longer saved, it's not because you lost it. It's because you gave it up. Come on. Salvation can never be lost. If you truly have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you cannot lose him. He's on the throne of your heart. But you can choose to give it up. You can choose to take him off the throne and allow your flesh and allow your own will and ego to take over. And you no longer abide under the, oh, come on. And you no longer dwell in that secret place with with, with, with the Most High and the Almighty. And therefore, you no longer abide under his shadow And then you can then stray away from him. But it's not that you've lost your salvation. It's that you have given it up. Can someone say amen if they understand? God gives you something. He doesn't ever take it back. Come on. When God gives you the gift of eternal life and salvation, it's not, oh, well, well, if you offend me, well, you know what? Sorry, I'm taking it back. No. 
if you continue to live a life that offends him, if you continue to live and practice in sin, what you end up happening is, is you're recreating that abyss that separates you again. You understand what you're doing. You're tearing down the bridge that has given you access onto the Heavenly Father. But I need you to understand, and today, that that gap was created by sin and condemnation before you knew Jesus. But when Jesus comes into your heart, God has filled in that gap with Jesus Christ. How many say amen? And as Christians and believers, though, that is not the only gap you have to deal with. We think, okay, well, my gap is is, is filled in. I've got the bridge put up. I'm good to go. I don't have to worry about anything else. There are continual gaps that appear in our lives. There's the gap that that exists in other areas of our life. We have gaps in our relationship with God. Did you know that? We fall short of where we want to be with God. We fall short in our spiritual growth and and, and in our prayer life. Uh, The gap that exists sometimes in our emotional state, in our emotional well-being and mental well-being. There are gaps that exist in the reality of the situation and condition of our trust and faith in God and his word. There are gaps that exist between where we currently are and where we want to be in our spiritual life and our spiritual maturity. There's gaps that exist between where we currently are and where we want to be in our relationship with God. We all have shortcomings. We are all imperfect. There are things in my life that I'm still working with. There are gaps in my life that I'm still progressively asking God to help me fill in those gaps. And we all have them in our lives. And in our relationship with God. But today, God wants to reveal to all of us what we can truly do and what will truly fill in the gap. Tell your neighbor, fill in the gap. That brings me to my first point. Point number one, we need to realize that grace and mercy fills the gap. That's number one. Grace and mercy fills the gap. Romans 3.23, I'm going to go back to the central scripture. This time I want to read verse 24 as well. 23, we read before, it says, For everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. And I'm reading this one out of the New Living Translation. And it says in verse 24, Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. We need to understand that it's all about mercy and grace. <laughs> if you are alive today, it's because you are breathing two things. When you take your breath in, you breathe in mercy. And when you breathe out, you're breathing grace. Can someone say amen? amen. Am I the only one that breathes in mercy and breathes out grace? Because I know that I don't deserve to be where I am today. Can someone help me out today? Hallelujah. I don't know about you. You may be all that in a bag of chips. You may be a happy meal with an extra size fries. But I know that I don't deserve where I am today. I should have been dead a long time ago. But in his mercy and his grace, I received God's favor. I received God's healing. I received God's restoration. Is there anyone else that has lived the life of healing and restoration in Jesus Christ in the house of the Lord? I have been made new. We all have. Can someone say amen? Amen. (laughs) And I always give a definition. You need to truly understand what mercy and grace is. And if you've heard me preach, you're already tired of it. But I need you to get this in your spirit, in your soul, in your cells, of your body, in your mind. To understand that mercy is not getting what we truly deserve. (laughs) We deserve condemnation. We deserve to die for our sins. See, the the dictionary gives us fancy definitions. Mercy is compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone uh, with with, with whom it's within one's right to punish them. Uh, Another one says lenient or compassionate treatment. But when you boil it down, it's simply not getting what you truly deserve. That's what that's what uh, mercy is. Grace has a bunch of nice definitions as well. Unmerited, divine assistance given to someone. Disposition or act uh, or an instance of kindness, courtesy, and clemency. But I just boil it down to getting what I don't deserve. That's what grace is. 
And when we come to Jesus and he is in our hearts uh, and we accept him as our savior, we divinely get mercy and grace every minute of your living life. Did you understand that? It didn't just happen once on the cross. Uh, it happens every single second of every single day that you are alive. Uh, you breathe in uh, his grace uh, and you exhale his mercy and you breathe in his mercy and you exhale his grace. Uh, and by grace, the Bible says we need to give by grace with what grace we have been given so how many can praise the name of God because he's been good to you and the word of God reveals that it's mercy and grace that fills the gap mercy and grace that bridges that abyss between any area and any area of our lives Look at what 1 Chronicles 16.34 says. It says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures for a day. Once in a while, when I'm in a good mood, when everything's working the way I want it to, it says, his mercies endure for Ever can someone say amen? Woo. I'm going through some rough stuff. Remember, his mercy endures forever. Woo. I may be going through some pain right now. Somebody has betrayed me. I am crying. I'm broken. I am devastated. But his mercy still endures. How many say amen? I was preaching Friday night to the men's ministry. And I said, you know what? The impossible things that God cannot do. And one of the things he cannot do is fail. And even in my failures, my God is still faithful. Come on, somebody help me preach this in the house of God. Even when I mess up, he never messes up. He is always there. He is always faithful. And he is always loving us. Can someone praise him in the house of God? Even when I'm broken, he's still there being faithful. Even when stuff is going wrong, in my eyes, God is still there. He is still merciful. I would say, you know what? If I'm going through a storm, if I'm getting beat down, drug out by life, if things are just working against me everywhere I go, and I'm wondering where God is, I remember his mercy endures forever. What does that mean? <laughs> oh, it sounds pretty. Oh, sounds nice. Yeah. Some people like to call it a spiritual band-aid. No, 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 no. It's a spiritual absolute truth. Because when you think what that means, it means that even things that are hurting me, it could be way worse. Come on. Mm, come on. I may not be where I want to be. I may not be in a situation that's comfortable. But when I look at what could be going on, where I look at where I could have ended up, uh, where I look at where I could have been, uh, I could have been six feet under. But yet I'm still breathing and I'm still living. Come on. Somebody praise the name of the Lord. Oh, I, every day of my life is a battle, literally, physically, emotionally, and mentally for all the stuff that I have going on in my body. But when someone asked me, Pastor, how you doing? I said, I'm breathing and I'm still walking. God is good, come on. I may not feel happy. I may not have always a smile on my face. I may wonder why it hurts so much. But what I can still remember is that God's mercy endures forever. Can someone say amen? amen. I could be way worse than I am right now. I could be stuck in a hospital bed, but God's got me up walking around. Can someone say amen? I could be dead a long time ago. I should have died 10 times over, but I'm still opening my eyes this morning. I thank you, God, for your mercy endures forever. Come on. Woo, my Lord. We take so much for granted. Uh, I've got my brother Crawford who almost didn't make it out of COVID, but look at where he is now. Come on, somebody praise him. Woo! That is a miracle walking right now. Uh, he could barely move. Sometimes it's hard for him to get out of bed, but guess what? God's mercy endures forever. Come on, somebody say amen. Oh, my Lord. First Peter, look at what the apostle Peter even tells us. Chapter 1, verse 3, New Living Translation. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his 
great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation, great hope in the eternal heavenly kingdom and everlasting life that we have in Jesus Christ. Can someone say amen? amen. It is God's grace that fills the gap created by our own weaknesses, our own limitations, and our own inabilities. Come on. We think, well, God, I can't do this. This is way too hard. Do you understand that God is not going to simply ask you to do things that you can do within yourself. This is what I don't understand, people. What do you expect from God? Look at his word. If you truly read his word, you would understand that when you serve the Lord, he's going to ask you to do stuff that's impossible for you to do. Ooh, pastor, that ain't fair. Who told you God is fair? We just, in fact, go to our YouTube channel, look for the sermon, God Ain't Fair. That's one of the titles of our sermons we preached recently. Because God is not fair. God is just, but he is not fair. Because God asks us to do the impossible. Why? If he only asks you to do what's possible for you, why would I ever need to trust God or depend on him for anything? Come on. Hmm. Let that marinate in your spirit a little bit. Let that bounce around in your head. Think about this. If God only asks you to deal with stuff that you can deal with, then I don't need to depend on him. I don't need faith. I don't need his word. I don't need his anointing. I don't need his power. I don't need his presence because I could do all things through me who strengthens me. But Philippians and Paul declares in verse 13 of chapter 4 that I can do all things through Christ, hallelujah, that strengthens me. How many say amen? amen? And it didn't say some things. It says all things, the impossible things, and the things that I can do. It doesn't matter how big they are. It doesn't how much, how matter how much it hurts. It doesn't matter how much it destroys everything else that's around me. If God allowed it, he's going to get me through it. Come on, somebody praise him in the house of God. I don't know why I'm going this direction, but the Holy Spirit is taking me here. You need to stop praying. God, take this away. Come on. Nobody's going to say amen now. Hmm. Hmm. God, please take this away. God said, I ain't taking nothing. Uh -uh. God says, I need you to go through it. But God, I can't do it. That's the point. Oh, come on. Do you think Cedric... Meshach and Abednego could get through the fiery furnace by themselves on their own power. But they still had to go in it and they still had to go through it. Could Moses divide the Red Sea all by himself? But yet God told him, you extend your rod and you divide the Red Sea. Could Lazarus come out of the grave on his own? Ooh. But what did Jesus say when he was in front of Lazarus' tomb? He didn't say, God, Father, raise him up. What did he say? Lazarus, come, oh, come on. Woo, God is in front of your situation, and he's calling your name. He's not saying Lazarus. He is saying, Edwin, come forth. Melanie, come forth. Sister uh, Julissa, come forth. He is calling you by your name to get up out of your self-pity, to throw the rags of defeat off of yourself, and declare the goodness and power of God over your life, and get up on his word and walk into your miracle. Can somebody praise him in the house of the Lord? yes his grace is sufficient for you his grace is sufficient but look at what Paul says come on 2 Corinthians 12 9 he was battling this great man of God every day with a weakness in his life and he says I asked God to take it away and what did God say look at in verse 9 he says my grace is is sufficient for you for my strength God is speaking is made perfect in weakness <laughs> the weaker you are in you the greater you are in God's power come on mm. you got to get this in you because somebody uh, somebody should be doing a praise dance right now 
You've been wallowing in self-pity and, and oh my God, and how can I be doing? Why did God let this happen? God is trying to tell you. It isn't by your strength. It isn't by your might. It is by my spirit, says the Lord. Hallelujah. But I can't shake it off. You need to just get up and live the life that God has called you to live. Forget about making mistakes. You're going to make them. When you're weak in yourself, you're going to make mistakes. But within the grace and mercy of God, grace covers where all the things you screw up happens. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. We're wrong. I just don't want to screw it up. If God said go, go. If you screw up, that's what his grace is for. Come on, somebody say amen. I love the way the New Living Translation says this. It says, my grace is all you need. Oh, my God. It's not something that we should want. It says we need grace. Do you understand I need grace just to wake up every day. I need grace just to be able to breathe. I need grace just to be able to walk one step in my life. Because without God's grace, I don't know where I would be. Without God's grace, where would you be? Can someone praise God for his mighty grace? <laughs> if you need nothing else, say, Lord, I need your grace. If you have nothing else to say, Lord, I just need your grace. <laughs> Why? Look at what Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 says. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. See, when we have God's grace, we can come boldly, it says, to that throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Oh, but I should be way better off. I, I, I should be spiritually stronger. There's a lot of stuff that you should have and could have and would have, but it's by his grace. Mm. Do you understand that when God has called you, I need somebody to understand this. The greater the calling, the greater the suffering is going to be that you're going to have to go through. And you think, well, then why do I want to be called? Because when he calls you and you go through the suffering, see, we want the salvation of Christ, but we don't want the suffering. Hmm. But didn't Jesus have to suffer for you and for me? Paul even says that if we're hopeful in the eternal coming glory, and we want that. We have to also be willing to submit ourselves to the suffering just like Jesus suffered. We may not get whipped. We may not have a crown of thorns on our head. We may not have to be hung up on a cross. But we're going to have to have to suffer some stuff. Can someone say amen? The Bible says, and Jesus even warned us, that you will be persecuted for my name. Hallelujah. When you bear the name of Jesus on your life, like I said to you before, you got to bullseye on your back uh, the world's gonna come after you satan is gonna come after you every legion in hell is gonna come after you because you are bearing something in you that they are terrified of and it is the power and the presence of the almighty can someone praise him in the house of the lord grace fills this gap and creates the bridge that gives us access to salvation and eternal life. Titus 2.11, New King James, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Paul in Ephesians reminds us as well, Ephesians 2, 4, and 5, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace, you have been saved. Woo. Second John 1, 3, New Living Translation says, Grace, mercy, and peace, which come from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, will continue. 
doesn't say it was. It doesn't say he gave. It says will continue to be with us who live in truth and love. Whose truth? His truth. Whose love? His love. Mm. Grace and mercy fills the gap. But you know what else? Point number two. Love fills the gap. Come on, tell your neighbor. It's all about love. Come on, tell him, tell him. It's all about love. Woo, yeah, that's right. I love you, honey. Tell your wife, tell your husband. Pastor died, I love you, honey. But it's all about not just that love, but it's about the love of God. More importantly, how many say amen? amen. I don't know if you remember, I've said this many times. I'm going to say it again. Love. So we think love of God. Okay, yeah, love. Love of God is it, 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 vertical. It's me to God and God to me. No, that's not what the Bible teaches us. When we live in the love of God, it is him to us and us to him. But it's not just vertical. The love of God has to be horizontal. It has to be to everyone around me. Jesus made it clear to his followers. By this, they will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. It's not enough to just love God, but you have to show that love of God to others in your life. Can someone say amen? amen. Okay, yes, I love the people that come to my church only. That's not what the Bible says either. I love you if you treat me nice. That is not what the Bible says either. Love is unconditional. Love is sacrificial. Love hurts. How many can say amen? <laughs> and it loves on a multiple facets and multiple areas. It hurts mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and even sometimes physically. How many say amen? And if it don't, then you ain't loving right. Come on, somebody. Oh, no, my love is never painful. I live, on a, I live on a cloud of love. Then you're not loving the right way. True love hurts. How many say amen? Pastor, that's masochistic. No, that's not. That's the reality. Jesus, his love for us hurt him. Do you believe it? Look at the Bible. He was beat down. He was spit on. He was condemned. He was innocent. It says, he who was incorruptible became corruptible. He who was without sin, be oh, come on, became sin. He was blameless. He was sinless. He was, he was God. Oh, somebody. That is the lesson for today's baptism class. Who Jesus is. Jesus is and was God. How many say amen? He didn't exist when he was born in a manger. He was existing before there was anything. He was and is God. He's eternal. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is the alpha. He's the omega. He has no beginning. Can someone say amen? amen. He was always there all the time and always will be. <laughs> Somebody says, well, when did the sacrifice of Jesus happen? When did it start? It wasn't when he was born in this world. Did you know that? It wasn't in the manger. Some people say, oh, no, it was when he was in Gethsemane. No, it wasn't there either. And it wasn't on the cross. It was in eternity. Mm. It started in eternity when God, before the foundation of anything, had already made a plan for our salvation. Do you understand that he loved you before he even made you? He loved you before you knew who he was. He loved you before he knew who you were going to be. He loved you before he had you in his mind to create you. That is the God that loves you, who is love, and has died for you to redeem you. Can someone praise him in the house of God? We know this, John 3, 16, come on. You should be saying this by heart. For God so loved the world that, who, that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believeth in him shall not perish and have everlasting life. That's the love of God for the whole world. Not one culture, not one color, not one language. Look around you. I see a rainbow of cultures in this sanctuary. Come on, somebody praise God. Come on, give yourselves a round of applause.
This is truly a multicultural ministry. We've got people from all over, Guyana, Jamaica, Africa, Nigeria. We've got Puerto Ricans. We've got Dominicans. We've got Salvadoranians. We've got uh, Anglos, because I don't want to say white, but okay, Anglo-Saxons. we got them all in here. Come on. Huh. If you don't belong to a diverse church, something's wrong. Something's, something's not right in that church. I always say it. <laughs> Every church should be a reflection of heaven. Come on. If you have a problem with going to a multicultural church, then guess what? <laughs> Don't worry about getting to heaven because you ain't going. Come on. You ain't going. Because when you get to heaven, who do you think is going to be up there? We're going to have every language known to man. And yet the beautiful thing is we're all going to understand each other. Come on. You're going to be in one mind, one accord, one spirit, one love. We're going to know what everybody's saying. We're going to enjoy it. We're going to have a, a corner with some Nigerian music. We're going to have some merengue going on. we got some salsa and cumbia. We're going to have, we're going to have R&B. We're going to have everything up there. We're going to be partying for the eternity in the presence of the Heavenly Father and praising the name of Jesus until he says he's up. Well, how many praise the name of the Lord? And love has made all that possible. Romans 5, 8, look at what it says. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us before we even accepted him. That's how love works. Well, I love you if you give me. I love you if, you, if you're nice. Okay, I love you. If you treat me bad, you know what? No, I ain't loving you. Then that ain't love. It isn't love. The whole concept of true love loves regardless of what you get in return. Even when they pay you evil, you love. Now, does that mean I'm going to allow you to keep hitting me on the head with the hammer? No. I love you, but I ain't stupid. Come on. God gave you some common sense. If you're in a toxic relationship, guess what? Shake it off in the name of Jesus. Said, I love you, but I love you from a distance. That's okay. We don't have to endure abuse. That's called abuse. But God says we still got to love them anyway. And if they get their act together, that's fine. Then let's come back. But if not, you know what? That's okay. I love you from afar. Come on, somebody praise him in the house of the Lord. John, 1 John 3, 1, look at what it says. I told you we're going to be using the Bible today. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God come on therefore the world does not know us because it's because it did not know him first John 4 9 through 11 says in this the love of God was manifested towards us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him in this love not that we love God but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Can someone say amen if they believe that word? And that brings me to the third and final point. We said grace and mercy fills the gap. We said love fills the gap. And point three, the word fills the gap. Woo. Do you know that Jesus is the word of God? How many say that? Amen. He embodies his word. John 1.1, 1, 1, famous verse. We should know it by heart. I love this verse. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. I say is because he is God. He still is. It is the word of God that will guide us, that instructs us, that reveals to us, that enlightens us, that strengthens us, and that facilitates the divine process of that gap being filled in our shortcomings. How many say amen? amen. Psalms 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That is what the word of God should be in every believer's life. John 6, 63 says, it is the spirit who gives life and the flesh profits nothing. And this is Jesus himself speaking. The words that I speak to you are spirit 
and they are life. Mm. Hebrews 4.13, New King James says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and the and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart oh my god that's power how many say amen that is what the word of god is in our lives it's a spiritual mirror i go beyond that because a mirror lets you see what's in you but you know what else it says it's a discerner of thoughts and intense of the heart. Woo! That's a spiritual x-ray MRI machine. Hmm. You know what an MRI and x-ray machine does, doesn't it? It shows you what's on the inside. That's what the Word of God does. It shows you what's in you. And it's a mirror that you use to rectify your life. When you look at yourself in the Word of God, it shows you and reveals what's inside that needs to get fixed, uh, what's keeping you, and that's not allowing you to bridge the gap in your relationship with God, what's not allowing you to bridge the gap in your personal relationships, uh, what's not allowing you to bridge the gap in your spiritual growth. Uh, it allows you to see what steps you need to take, and through the power of the Word of God, as Jesus said, it becomes, it is spirit and life. So it not only reveals, but it empowers, come on, it empowers you to build your faith. Because the Bible says in the book of Romans that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Through that Word of God. We are equipped and empowered, and the gap that exists in our capacity to please God is bridged through his word. Because as I said in Romans 10, 17, it comes by hearing and hearing by his word. But look at what Hebrews eleven six 6 says. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder's of who of those who diligently seek him so the faith is built in you through the word of god and without that faith it would be impossible for you to please god so the word fills the gap between you and pleasing god somebody mm, come on i wish i had more time oh see true salvation is not about what you do. <laughs> it's not about religious traditions and processes and prayers and, and things that you do and say what impresses God. Hallelujah. Oh, come on. It's not your talents and abilities and your eloquent speech and your ways of being able to express yourself and how pretty you can praise God and worship him in the temple. That's not what impresses God and pleases him. What impresses God and pleases him is your faith in him. Can someone say amen? And when you have faith in God, you have to obey God. Can someone praise the name of the Lord now? Faith requires obedience. Do you understand that true faith is not faith until you live it? Come on. Ooh. Oh, Pastor. Oh, that, that, that was heavy. Ooh, wait a minute. I got to sit down for a second. Ooh. I even got dizzy on that one. Whoa. Faith is not faith until you have to face and live the situation that you're in. Whether God does or whether God doesn't do. Come on. I've said it before, and I feel like I need to say this again. True faith is not believing that God will always do and that he can do. True faith is believing God and obeying him even when he doesn't do what I know he can do. Can someone say amen now? And to conclude, church, I want to end with this. We said it clearly. I'm going to go over these things again. Grace and mercy fills the gap. Love fills the gap. The word fills the gap. But the one true bridge and the one true filler of the spiritual gap that exists between man and God for an eternity is 
and any gap in any area of our lives is Jesus Christ. Jesus fills the gap. Can you say amen, church? Can you get on your feet, church, right now? Come on, get on your feet with me. I want to remind you what the book of John says because Jesus himself said it. He declared it. He said it in John 14, 6, New King James. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father. In other words, no one bridges the gap to the Heavenly Father except through me. That's what he said. And he, Jesus, is grace and mercy incarnate. Jesus is the embodiment of the love of God. And Jesus is the word of God. So all those things we said that fills the gap, you can put it all under one name. Jesus. Come on, somebody say, Jesus. Jesus. Say it again, Jesus. There is no other name, <laughs> nor in heaven, nor in earth, nor under the earth, uh, that can save you, that can heal you, that can empower you, that can reveal to you, that can make you new. Uh, and his name is Jesus Christ. <laughs> Yeshua. <laughs> Oh my God, it's not religion, it's a relationship with Jesus. Religion, you need to understand, says you're bad, but I'm good. And yet, you still got all this stuff you got to do, and you still will never make it to God. You know what relationship says? It says, you're bad, but I'm way worse. But guess what? It doesn't matter, because Jesus Christ is our Lord and our Savior. Can we say amen now? That's why we could go back to the central scripture. It says, for everyone has sinned, Romans 3, 23 and 24, and fallen short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. And Timothy reconfirms this, 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God, one mediator, one mediator, one bridge, one intercessory between God and man, and his name is Christ Jesus. That's what Titus tells, Timothy tells us. Church, we need to understand what Romans said and what Paul said in Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege. Woo. Where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. It is Jesus and only Jesus that can truly fill the gap. But in order for Jesus to fill that gap, he has to be in the throne of your heart. How many say amen? How many got a word? If you got a word today, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. God bless you. 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 If God spoke to you today, say, God, I got my word. If you're online, type in the comments. I got my word. Hallelujah. You may have gaps all over your life, but Jesus fills every single one of them. Come on, say amen. Declare it in the name of Jesus. He fills my gap. His grace is sufficient. His grace is all you need. All you need is the grace of God. Before I end the service, if you don't know Jesus, then I invite you to accept him into your heart right now so you can have him fill those gaps for you. Stop trying to be perfect. You're never going to make it. But Jesus will fill the gap. How many say amen? We're going to say this as we always do every week. I always say this prayer. So if you want to reconcile yourself, you want to get yourself right, I say if you say this with all the faith in your heart, then you will be reconciled, you will be a born-again Christian, and you will be a new creation in the name of Jesus. And we're going to say it as we always do, and we have it up on the screen. It says, Heavenly Father, I come before you, and I know that I am a sinner. I truly repent and ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I accept the sacrifice of your only begotten son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross of Calvary, where he shed his blood for me to wash me of all my sins. And I believe that he rose from the dead on the third day. And I declare Jesus Christ, the Lord of my heart, and accept him 
as the Savior of my soul. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. The church says, amen, amen. Can we give Jesus a round of applause in the house of God today? Someone has said that prayer, amen. Before we go, I want to say hello. We have a couple of visitors. We have Julissa's family with us today. We got Matthew, amen, which is Julissa's son, and says, and her granddaughter. Where is he? Where is she? Oh, there she is. God bless. Come on, give them a warm applause and welcome to them, Myla and Matthew. Welcome. God bless you, mama. God bless you, brother. brother. Were you blessed today? Amen. Awesome. Praise the Lord. How many are happy? Hallelujah. How many happy? Amen. Come on, come on. Praise God if you're happy today. You are blessed because Jesus fills the gap. Come on. Tell them, Jesus fills the gap. Say it. Jesus fills the gap. Come on. Amen. Let me bless you so you can be dismissed. Baptism class, 11 o'clock. Take a break. Get some coffee. Come back. We're going to be right behind the pulpit here today, okay? So guys, come back for baptism class. Let's go. Let's be blessed. Bring in somebody next week. Come on, I challenge you to bring some visitors in. Let's get this house full for God's honor and glory. Amen. Let us be, let us be dismissed. I'll bless you so you mean to dismiss. Ready? You know it? Say it loud, say it proud. Come on. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and have mercy on you. May the Lord raise his countenance upon you and give you true peace. I now bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry, I had some, I saw somebody do something. Praise the Lord. May God bless you guys. Be this man, we love you, bless you.